Guys, before we start this week's video, I want to humbly ask for your support. If you go to my website, eddytrask.com, and then you go to the sponsorship section, you can see the different ways to donate. All the donation would go towards keeping this channel running. I started in January, so about four months ago. Um, so humbled by the viewership. I think we've surpassed, I think there's there are two key metrics with YouTube, just so you guys know. One of them is getting to 4,000 hours or what they call watch hours. And so we just surpassed that last week, which is phenomenal. And then the other metric is getting to 1,000 subscribers. It's the most difficult thing to do. I think we're close to 500. Um, so I just want to invite you to support the channel. If you enjoy the channel, please share it with others. Pick your favorite testimonies and share them with others, please. I would greatly appreciate that. Like the videos, comment on the videos, and make sure that you ask others to subscribe if they are into hearing testimonies. Whether they're Catholic or not, these are stories of Christians. So we have to remember that at the, at the end of the day, these are Christian testimonies. And the point is, we want to be encouraging to everyone that is on their faith journey. Also, some of you know, many of you don't. I wrote a book that came out last September. It's called Confessional. It's a memoir that covered 2017 to 2019. This book is available on Amazon. I self-published it, um, worked tirelessly for about a year and a half going through all the crap that my wife and I uh, dealt with over that period of time. You guys check out the preface. You can also preview the book um, on Amazon. If you know anyone that has dealt with addiction, anyone that deals with scrupulosity, anyone that deals with sexual sin, the list goes on and on. Please consider sharing this, consider purchasing it. Um, it's very difficult for many people to read it because it does dive deep into man's psyche, uh, but I felt called to write it. And I would greatly appreciate you getting the word out about my book. So thank you. Thank you for all of those, all of you that have watched the first, I think, 20 episodes here and have been so supportive in the comments. I just encourage you to continue getting the word out um, just on behalf of the Catholic faith in general. And with that, let's get into this week's video. Take care. Bye. Hello, folks. Welcome to this week's episode of Catholic Recon, Testimonies from Reverts and Converts. Before I get to this week's guest, I want to remind you to subscribe to my channel and let every revert and convert in your life know about the channel so that I can interview them. And then also new episodes will continue to air every Tuesday at three o'clock Mountain Standard Time. So this week's guest is Father Michael Joseph Groark, and I want to get this right. He was recently, this was a, as of last year, recently appointed director of the Capuchin Vocation Office for the province of St. Joseph. His ministry focuses on three things, and hopefully we'll be able to get into this later in the interview, recruitment, accompaniment, and discernment. And his mom reached out to me through email and said, you know, my son would be great for this little show of yours, and you should reach out to him. So I did, and I'm very grateful. So Father Michael Joseph, welcome. Thank you, Eddie. Yes, uh, my mother is my biggest cheerleader and uh, PR director, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> she sent me an email, says, you'll love this YouTube channel, and I send him an email on your behalf. So, excellent, excellent. And uh, just one little correction, Eddie, it's yeah. pronounced Capuchin. Most people say capuchin, and that's totally normal. Um, we hear that all the time, but it's capuchin, like the capuchin monkeys. Got it. So I've been with the capuchin friars um, since 2007. Uh, I was ordained a priest December 7th, 2019 on the feast of St. Ambrose, the bishop. And uh, so I'm a little newbie priest, as they say, uh, you know, but yeah, I currently serve the brothers, the community as the uh, director of vocations for the Midwest Capuchin province of St. Joseph. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks for the correction. That's <laughs> we hear it all the time. It's, it's fun. Well, cool. Why don't you, yeah, start from the beginning. Uh, very curious to hear the, the journey. Yeah. So, um, you know, when I, 
I was telling you a little bit off camera, but you know, I do a lot of preaching and evangelization work. Um, it's, it's a gift I've been given. I cultivate and I, I like standing up in front of people and talking uh, about God. And, uh, you know, I have all these topics and education and things that I've been playing with, uh, but the most requested thing, uh, coast to coast, people want to hear my conversion story. And uh, I think that's, that's fascinating. Um, and it makes sense. I mean, you know, I think it was St. Paul the sixth and Pope Francis has certainly reiterated this sentiment is that, um, the church grows more from witnesses, you know, than anything else. And, um, and, I think that's what moves hearts, you know, so when I tell my story, because it's a complicated story, but it's a good story, um, you know, for many years when I was, I'd go around and tell my, my journey into the church and my vocation, uh, I used to call it, you know, like Brother MJ's story, <laughs> a story about my life, and uh, it took several years of working through this um, as a healing process for myself, but also, uh, you know, becoming more confident as a public speaker and preacher, and I realized that's a, it's very hubris, <laughs> you know, and it's really not a story about me at all. It's really a story about God and how God works. Um, and I like to frame this kind of as a journey of metanoia, um, you know, and this is a, a Greek word we see a lot in the scriptures, metanoia, 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 especially the letters of Paul. And most people kind of interpret this word as conversion, um, a, you know, a turning around or a turning away from and a turning towards. Uh, I took a great seminar in my um, graduate studies for theology and this professor kind of broke open this concept for me a little bit. And I just said, ah, that's, that's way more intense than just conversion. So, you know, when you look at metanoia, it's a coming together of two words, uh, meta and Noia, so meta, like metaphysics, right? So like going beyond or underneath something. And noia, like nous, the Greek word for the higher mind, the higher rational mind. Um, so it's actually like going beyond the mind, uh, which to me is a much more potent uh, kind of idea. And really, I think that's what the Christian journey is about, you know, is allowing Christ uh, to enlighten us, to pull us beyond the current state of affairs and um and to go to the higher mind you know with god and um and so me i, I spent a lot of my life kind of stuck in that lower mind and and living of the world and um of the senses and um so mine's a journey of metanoia really um and it, it continues and it will continue until i'm dead and buried so um it's a fantastic adventure yeah i was born in sacramento california um parents, Michael and Anna Marie Gork. Uh, I'm one of three brothers. We were raised in a pretty rough neighborhood. Uh, I would say, you know, um, we were very poor for sure. Uh, a lot of gang violence, um, poverty, but we had a great childhood. And, you know, my parents did just a phenomenal job of shielding us from a lot of the nonsense and um, stuff happening around us and, and the violence and even our own uh, poverty, you know, I mean, we had a great childhood. And uh, I like to say very early on that really the cornerstone of our family life, and um, I think what protected us from a lot of what was happening around us was our faith. And we were raised um, Protestant, Lutheran. Um, and I say, you know, Lutheran kind of loosely, uh, you know, my family is one of those families that we would just go to any kind of church, um, you know, on any given Sunday. Um, but we had a great understanding of this person, Jesus, who really, really loved us and wanted a personal relationship with us. And, you know, I will never, ever talk bad about my Protestant roots because it gave me a tremendous, we actually read the Bible for one, you know, I mean, so it gave me a tremendous love for the word of God. Um, at least as a child, I had this kind of concept of this, this guy, Jesus, that really loved me and influenced our, our family and our life. So, you know, we, we go to church on Sundays, we do Sunday school, we would pray before meals. Um, this is what kept our family together, you know, and, and gave me somewhat of a moral compass um, growing up. Uh, but 
you'll see, I mean, that kind of got a little confusing uh, later on in life and it really didn't have the, the roots, you know, the teeth, uh, the guts that I needed um, when I started getting older and questioning things. Um, so my dad was a lifelong photographer. That's an important thing to know because his kind of career in the photography industry is really what continued to move our family um, throughout our, our evolution. Um, so I spent 10 years in Sacramento, rough, but a good childhood. My dad's company with the photography industry kept promoting him, promoting him, promoting him. And, you know, he was climbing the corporate ladder. And so that meant a, a physical move. And also getting into like the junior high years, my parents didn't want us going to high school <laughs> in Sacramento, you know, is kind of rough. And um, so they made the decision to follow my dad's career path. And we picked up and we moved north up to Vancouver, Washington and the, the Portland, Oregon area. Um, so, you know, Fast forward, uh, I, I'm still going to my Protestant church every week. I'm involved in youth group. And this is that weird time for young people, right? So I'm like about to get into like my high school years, uh, eighth grade, ninth grade, yeah. um, loosely going to church. I'm involved in youth groups. There's this guy, Jesus, that really loves me, but you know, it didn't like really mean anything to me. You know, I was going through the motions and you know, I remember getting ready to go into that strange place we call high school, you know, ninth grade. And, uh, and I was sure I knew who I was. You know, I remember looking back on that saying, I go to my youth group every Wednesday night and we read scriptures and we sing all these songs and I'm going to go into this public high school. <laughs> I'm going to go into the public high school in Vancouver, Washington. I'm going to convert the whole school. I'm going to be the kid who you know, witnesses to Christ and love of the scriptures, and maybe I'll start a prayer group. I mean, I thought this kind of stuff, and it was, you know, like I, my heart was on fire for Jesus um, in a way. And within about 30 seconds of crossing that threshold into a public high school, I mean, I realized like, you know, the, the quick path to popularity and socialization and all this stuff is not the Jesus freak, <laughs> you know, and that was just kind of a rude awakening for me. Um, and like girls were a thing and, you know, and sports and, uh, and all of that and clicks. And it was this huge public high school. And uh, so I just said, <clears throat> see you later, Jesus. Uh, I'll compartmentalize you for Sunday mornings. Um, and then I'm going to kind of figure out who I am. And I think this is pretty normal. I mean, for most young people um, in those precious years of development and identity formation and socialization. And, and so I was, you know, I just ate up the culture, you know, um, spoon fed it to myself, you know, I mean, instantly. And um, then I started figuring out, you know, boy, I'm like really good at wearing these like masks. <laughs> and, you know, I only realized this kind of in hindsight, but you know, how quick I was to just throw my faith out the window. It didn't have the roots, the teeth in my life. And uh, I was more concerned about being accepted and popular and fitting in. And so I got into sports and cliques and groups and ideas were coming at me and I didn't know how to answer them. And um, so I would put on a mask on Sunday morning and go to church, you know, with mom and dad. Um, but then I would start hanging out with different groups of kids in, in school, ninth grade and 10th grade. And uh, all of a sudden, like promiscuity is a thing and um, marijuana was a thing and going to parties on weekends and getting blackout drunk was like a thing. And, and it seemed right and just, you know, at the time. Um, and then I would go back to church on Sunday morning. So you can see how this was starting to create a bit of an internal conflict pretty early on. And I started, you know, questioning things and why am I even going to these churches? And we would church hop. And this was another kind of confusing thing looking back is like any Protestant church that I would walk into on any corner on any given Sunday that my parents would take us to, um, you know, it's like every pastor was preaching about truth and morality, but every like pastor was their own Pope, Bishop, priest, you know, and had a different interpretation about human flourishing or the good life and, um, what's right and wrong. Yeah. And I was creating my own kind of warped moral compass, you know, at this time too. So I was just a conflicted young person. Um, so 
that's all swirling around ninth grade, 10th grade. Um, towards about the halfway point of my sophomore year, uh, you know, getting into my junior year, I hit 16 years old. And so in the state of Washington, I was able to um, get a worker's permit. And, you know, my dad always instilled this great drive for like success and business. And um, as early as I can remember, Eddie, I had a camera in my hand. I mean, and same with my brothers. My dad is just in our blood is to be photographers. And, and my dad, you know, gave us this amazing gift when we were little boys, you know, he would take us out to shoot sunrises and sunsets and flowers and sports and he taught us how to see the world differently, you know, through the lens of a camera, a different perspective. And so when I turned 16, I said, all right, dad, I'm ready to start working. You know, can you get me a job at, at one of your stores? He was a district manager for a camera company. So he oversaw, you know, like 20, 30 stores in the Pacific Northwest. And he says, all right, kid, let's see what you can do. You know, I'm going to put you on as a part-time salesman at my smallest store in Vancouver Mall when malls used to be a thing. And uh, he says, you know, let's see what you can do. Um, and I was real good at it. I mean, so enter another mask, right? Um, and like they say, you know, you could sell a catch up popsicle to a woman in white gloves. Yeah, that was me. I was real good. And, um, and so was my dad. And so were my brothers. We we're naturals because we love photography. We love talking about it. And so selling it was just a natural kind of evolution of that. And so I started working and making my dad super proud on the business front. And I was climbing the ladder very early on and setting myself up for great success. Um, and, uh, and then I'd go to church on Sundays and not really care what was being told. And even by then I started like, you know, sleeping in on some Sundays cause like, well, what's the point anyway? So that's another mask. I go home and pray and eat dinner with my family. There's another mask, but then I, be out at 16 years old all weekend getting blackout drunk, high, being promiscuous. Um, and now I've got all this money in my pocket from this budding career. So now I've just got like, you know, I'm going crazy, you know, and I'm worried about clothes and cars and um, worldly things, yeah. uh, you know, worldly things. So this is all kind of swirling around. Um, I get into my junior year of high school. I'm still climbing the corporate ladder. I'm his top salesman. By the time uh, I get into my senior year, uh, things start getting a little uh, twisted, more twisted in my life. So again, masks and masks and masks. I think there's a good kind of golden thread for my life. Um, I was 4.0 student, you know, honor roll. Uh, I had enough credits to actually graduate early. Um, I'm working a full-time job. I'm making more money uh, in my career than pretty much any teacher at my high school. And I'm already promised a position as a manager of a $5 million camera store the day I graduate. Um, so I've got a humongous ego, you know, kind of blossoming. But not only that, um, you know, and I, I tell this to parents at this part in my story, it's like, I'm no prude, you know, and I know the world we live in and I, I understand um, young people development and socialization, all that. Um, I think for a lot of young people, um, you know, experimenting with certain things to a certain extent, let me be very careful. I say this is, is quote normal. I mean, you know, this is, you know, kids are going to be kids uh, most of the time and, and might smoke a little marijuana try some alcohol. Most people will do that and truly experiment and then move past it, you know, and kind of flourish. But for some of us, um, for some people, these are like seeds being planted, you know, for um, a very dark trajectory. Um, and it's like never enough, you know, and people who are just naturally addicts. And I'm one of those people. So, you know, um, I was smoking pot every day, um, all day, even at school. Um, I was selling large amounts of marijuana. I, by the time I was a senior in high school, I was doing psychedelics, uh, amphetamines, you name it. I mean, there really wasn't ecstasy. You know, there really wasn't anything that I hadn't experimented with. So you could imagine, I, I, I was done going to church. Um, you know, by about my junior year in high school, I just said, nah, I, I don't have time for that. You know, it's me, myself, and I, 
eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow you may die. Um, it, we, we have a term for this in philosophy, right? It's moral relativism. I mean, um, two plus two can equal four for my pastor, but it's five for me. Exactly. Don't impose your four on my five, right? So, um, you know, I was professor moral relativist, and uh, I was going to create my own sense of truth and identity, and... Um, damn anyone who told me otherwise even my parents or a pastor and I didn't need anyone else telling me how to live uh the good life because I was having fun and it felt good and um I had a lot of money and a big ego and uh so it's kind of a wild time you know my junior year going into my senior year so I've got all this swirling around masks and masks and masks and masks um I'm making my dad super proud at business um I got a bright future ahead of me so they think yeah uh, about halfway through my senior year in high school uh and my two brothers god bless them they were both basically on the same path i was you know so my parents were faithful they kept going to church you know and they kept holding the faith and we just kind of like thought they were jokers you know like you guys still believe this stuff and we thought they were going to their protestant church and so one day about halfway through my senior year i'm getting close to graduation and uh my parents sit us down in the living room, right? So they sit us all down, line us up on the couch. And they're like, we got to have a family meeting. And, you know, looking back, I'm thinking, oh gosh, like, are they getting a divorce, you know, or something like it was one of those heavy, like, we got to talk to you boys, like the real solemn kind of thing. And they sit us down and my mom and dad, they got their arms around each other. And they said, we need to tell you something very important that's happening in our lives, boys. Um, for the past year and a half, um, we have been on a faith journey. We've been um, going deeper into our Christian identity and uh, we haven't told you boys anything because it's been very private and we're discerning and figuring out where God's calling us to. So we're just like holding our breaths, like where is this going, right? And uh, my dad says, and so after a year and a half, we have decided to become Roman Catholic. <laughs> right, I mean, so I'm like, okay. So at this point in my relativistic journey, um, I already have this huge distrust of Christianity in general. But, you know, we also were kind of fed a lot of this anti-Catholic stuff growing up in certain um, churches that we would go to. And, um, you know, they worship saints, they worship Mary, all the basic kind of things. And so I'm thinking, wow, my parents have drank the Kool-Aid. I mean, they've literally joined a cult and they're going to burn in hell, which was an odd thing, you know, um, to condemn my parents to this metaphysical reality of hell when I'm basically an atheist at this point, um, you know, and I'm trying to argue against God and religion and uh, scientism and humanism and all this kind of stuff. Um, and I was just like, wow, I was just like, my parents are lost. I mean, I remember sitting there going like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. And I just didn't care. And I just wanted to leave the house and go get high and just forget about it. And then my, my dad says, there's one more thing. And he walks around the corner and he comes back with this like four foot tall statue of Our Lady of Guadalupe. <laughs> and he goes, boom, and he puts it right in the middle of the living room. And he says, and this is your mother now. And I was like, oh no, I was like, yeah, they're they're way gone, you know, they're, they're worshiping idols and this and that. And, um, quite a statement there. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and he, they tried giving us rosaries and scapulars and me and my brothers were just like, this is crazy, right? Like we, we didn't understand anything. And so that was kind of my, um, egoic moment to just flee headfirst into the world. You know, I'm like, my parents are lost. Um, they're damned and, uh, I don't need them anymore you know, and so I graduated high school. I took job as a, uh, a manager for one of my dad's uh, bigger stores. I was largely successful. And within a year, they transferred me down to Southern California to oversee three stores. Um, so just hold this all together, right? So I'm like 19 years old. Uh, I've got a drug problem. You know, I'm using marijuana, cocaine, methamphetamine, like on a daily basis. Um, I'm now down in Southern California making tons of money. I have no moral compass, company credit card, wow. living on the beach like a playboy. I mean, it was just like a recipe for disaster. Um, but I was real good at hiding all of this. 
you know, and I'd show up to work and the drugs actually helped me. Uh, so I thought, you know, I'm more productive. Yeah. I'm up longer, um, yada, yada, yada. So I'm down there working for a couple of years and uh, I get a phone call one day from my dad and he says, um, the company has offered me a big opportunity uh, here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, we're going to acquire a camera store called Camera World is downtown Portland, Oregon, an entire city block long cameras, video equipment, professional stuff. And uh, it does like a hundred million dollars a year. So they're asking me to be at the helm of this, give up my whole um, district, all my other stores to manage this. And I can put together a dream team of management staff and I'd like you to come work for me. So I said, yeah, let's do it. You know, so me and both of my brothers worked with my dad at this one location. It was like a little dynasty. Uh, so we moved back to Portland, but I brought my little monkey on my back, my drug habit with me. And um, my dad had no idea. And uh, so for, you know, a good year or so, I just kept pumping out sales and making him super proud. Um, but I, it was never enough. I was never satisfied. You know, I was making tons of money, more money than I could spend legally but I got deeper and deeper into this other world. So I'd worked nine to five at camera world with my dad, making him super proud. And then from 5 PM until 9 AM the next morning, I'm out running the streets with like, um, like drug cartel members. And, um, and I start selling, you know, large amounts of drugs and cocaine and amphetamines. And um, it's just like a miracle that, yeah, anyways, we won't get too deep into those details, but um, I was making three, four times the amount of money illegally um, than I was, um, you know, legally. And um, you can see, you know, where this kind of extreme relativism can lead, you know, and um, when it's just a, an insatiable quest for power and status and sensual, um, you know, appeasement. And so, it was just never, ever enough. Uh, but I'd keep showing up to work, suit and tie, cufflinks, um, make my dad super proud. He had no idea. So one day, um, now hold in your mind, this was about 2003, um, just to give your, your listeners a time frame. And uh, so back then, um, this next chapter of the story um, I was kind of on the front lines of this epidemic that we're dealing with the consequences of now. But back then, this was unheard of, brand new. So I get a call from one of my drug dealers, guys I, I was in cahoots with. He says, uh, yo, MJ, you got to come over to my house uh, after work. I got something that's going to change your life. you know." And these are like haunting words. He's like, you will absolutely love this. And so I went there and he showed me this handful of these little green pills that had the letters OC written on them. Uh, we had never seen these before, but he said that he would bought them from cancer patients. These are known as Oxycontin. Um, and for any of the listeners, I mean, we're the, the government right now is like, you know, suing these companies um, that produced these medications and flooded um the streets with them basically and we're over prescribing them for many many years i was on the front line of this um hugely potent synthetic opioid um that were supposed to be for the sickest of the sick people yeah. they were everywhere overnight and uh we used some of those pills and i felt like superman um and that is it's very scary i mean it, back then i remember thinking this is what heaven must feel like and that's, that's what's really evil, you know, about all of this. Um, and I was just like flying at work, you know, and start, we had no idea of how opioid addiction worked. And so me and this whole circle of friends were just like using these pills all day, every day. And they were very cheap and they were everywhere. And so I'm able to keep this up for a good like year working with my dad and he had no idea. And then one day they went away. And then we all figured out what it really means to be addicted to opioids when you don't have them. And so all of a sudden I've got this entire world of people in my life that are all very, very ill because we're detoxing. And within about 24 hours, uh, we get another phone call. He says, I cannot get those pills anymore 
but I got something better. And he handed me a balloon of black tar heroin. And uh, this is, you know, you can pick up any newspaper across the country. You're going to read the same chain of events, uh, prescription opioids, street level heroin. Um, and it worked for a while, but it was dirty and um, uh, just very sad, you know, and so we all got addicted to heroin and um, several of my friends overdosed, um, God rest their souls. Um, yeah, it was a really, really dark time. And of course, now by this point, I'm like a struggling opioid addict and uh, I can only keep up the charade for so long, right? I mean, so I'm, I'm working literally in the same building with my dad and I'm coming into work three hours late, four hours late, not even showing up, calling in with every excuse under the book. And, um, and one day I remember sneaking in the back door, I'm like four hours late to a shift and um, my dad calls me on the sales floor. So let me paint a picture for you what this store looked like. So you walk into camera world and you actually walk down a flight of stairs. So the store is like sunken down, you know, street level. And it's just a huge store. And then my dad's office was this big glass box office that, that we like a bird's nest, you know, like he had this like omnipotent kind of uh, view of all of us little minions. And, and he would always like walk up there and pace and watch the sales floor and we'd do something good. He'd call us good sale, good sale, you know, and da, 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 or did you offer them this and that, you know, and he'd coach us. So he calls me and he says, Michael Joseph, get up to my office immediately. And he hangs up the phone. And I had never heard this tone of voice from my dad. And so I walk up to his office and he tells me to take a seat and then he closes the blinds. Again, something I had never seen before. And so I just, I knew um, this was not gonna end well. And uh, I'm dope sick, I'm detoxing. Um, I'm just in a miserable place. My life is literally falling apart. And uh, my dad sits down across this desk from me and he's a he's a strong man proud man a uh, good holy man and my dad just starts to weep and uh and he says michael joseph um i know everything that's going on you know i've been following you i know what you're up to um i know you've been stealing from the company I know you've been embezzling money. I know you've been, you know, and he just started laying out all of this stuff. And he says, this, you have broken my heart. Um, and he says, and I have no other choice, but you're fired. I mean, he's just like, I, I can't cover for you on this. Like, you know, I have no choice. You, you have broken my heart this day. Um, and he says, get out of my store and I'm going to do my best to make this <laughs> right you know, and my head was so full of drugs and ego that I'm just like, I don't need you. Um, and I, I said, see you later, bud. And I walked out of that, um, that store. And within a matter of three months, everything I had built up, my whole world, housing, uh, cars, everything was repossessed. Um, within like three to four months, I was homeless. Um, eating out of trash cans and um, robbing people and much worse things, you know, to uh, survive and to get another bag of heroin. <laughs> and uh, I did that for two and a half years. Uh, just, uh, it, and Portland, Oregon is a terrible place to be homeless. It rains there like nine months out of the year, you know, so I was just like a wet, sick dog um, walking the streets and um, my ego was so big that I couldn't reach out to my family for help. Um, in hindsight, my parents told me they were driving the streets like all night, every night, going to homeless shelters and driving up and down alleys, screaming my name. And, oh, man. you know, um, and that's the thing about addiction is like you create this, uh, this storm, you make others sick with you. Um, and God bless my parents, you know, um, but they were just, you know, the swept into my madness and, um, and they hadn't heard my voice for two and a half years and uh, I could care less. I was just in a very dark place with dark people doing dark things. And um, so it's pretty sad. So, um, you know, I did that for two and a half years. And um, one day, you know, they, they say in 12 steps, like sometimes for some of us <laughs> who are really hard headed, like you gotta hit absolute rock bottom and hopefully you do. So the only place you have to look is up, you know, there's like, there's, 
you know, I exhausted, I robbed everyone, including my family. Um, you know, I had abused everyone in my life. I had no one else to take advantage of. And I was just at this point where I was sick of being sick. And so, uh, you know, I said, okay, I just, I have no other choice. I have to reach out to my parents, you know, or I'm going to die. If I do one more balloon of drugs, I'm going to die. I call it a signal grace or something. I was just like, I knew that I would die if I did one more bag of heroin. And uh, so I remember being under this bridge in the industrial town part of Portland. I'm wrapped up in these old blankets and cardboard boxes. And I I said, I just have to pray. And like the only prayer I could think of from my Protestant days was the Our Father. And so I just, I prayed the Our Father with all of my heart and I passed out and I woke up the next day and um, I had just the first moment of clarity that I'd had in almost three years. I said, call your dad, call him right now. So I said, okay. So I, I go to a gas station and they still had pay phones back then. If you can remember those things. So I got like 35 cents. I put it in the payphone and I dial 360-281-4001. I will forever remember that. That was my dad's cell phone number. And the why I, I say that is because unbeknownst to me, um, so there's a little pause in the story. Uh, and while I'm two and a half years running around like a crazy person, my parents, remember who had joined that little Catholic cult? Well, they, they kept going deeper and deeper and deeper into their faith. And uh, even in the midst of all of my chaos. So in the last six months of my journey on the streets, um, they had made a pretty profound decision. So my dad's running this humongous camera store. He's making tons of money, powerful businessman. My mom's in the medical industry. They're all in the Pacific Northwest, friends, family. They got this kid lost on the streets. And so this is all happening in their life. And uh, one day my dad's reading a Catholic newspaper in, uh, Portland, Oregon. And you know, on the back of these Catholic newspapers, how they have ads for different local businesses. Yeah. So there's a little square, one inch by one inch on the back of the Portland, Oregon newspaper that says Marion Center of Milwaukee needs manager phone number. And my dad's like, well, this is bizarre. Like what Milwaukee, you know, what's a Milwaukee? And, uh, and he has no idea. So he puts the newspaper where he goes to bed. Well, it kind of like haunted him, as he says. He wakes up in the middle of the night and uh, goes back into his office, grabs that newspaper, looks at it again, wakes my mom up, says, what's a Marion Center? And what's up? She's like, go to bed, you weirdo. What are you doing? He, goes, he couldn't figure it out. So she says, well, just call him in the morning. He calls, talks to the people, reports back to my mother, says, well, the Marion Center is a Catholic bookstore in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And they want to fly me out uh, to see if I could be the manager of this. My mom thinks my dad's just nuts, right? So do whatever you want. So he flies out there, comes back. She says, so how'd it go? He goes, well, the bookstore is about the size of our spare bedroom in our house. Uh, I would make about $30,000 a year. And it's awesome. <laughs> you know, there's rosaries and Catholic books and we can study apologetics and we can sell artwork and talk about our faith. And my mom says, well, let's pray about it. And what do you think? And um, my dad's like, I think we're being called to do this. And I don't know why. And my mom says, well, what about MJ? What about our son? And they're, you know, they just said, we've got to trust God. We've got to trust God. So this was about six months before I hit my rock bottom. So they had packed up everything and moved halfway across the country, unbeknownst to me. My mom says that um, that last day in their house in Vancouver, Washington, they had a, the U-Haul packed up, my dad's sitting in their engine revving, and they're kind of sad, you know, and they're thinking about me and all their friends, and they're about to say a last goodbye. And my mom says, I just want to go back in the house one more time. So she goes in and she fell on her knees in an empty house and she uttered a prayer that no mother should ever, ever have to pray. And she says that, um, I still get choked up. I'm sorry. Every time I did this, uh, oh, man. it's powerful. But um, she says in her mind, she saw Jesus crucified and at the foot of the cross was Mary. And then she had this vision of, me as a baby in my baptismal garment and uh and she handed me to mary 
and she said, um, Mother Mary, I give you my son because <clears throat> she said, you know, if there's any mother in the whole world who knows the pain of losing a child, it's you, you know, and uh, she prayed that either I would end up dead or in jail because either way I wouldn't be sick and I wouldn't be alone. And uh, like no mom should ever have to pray that prayer, but thank God, you know, I mean, uh, prayers work, <laughs> you know, prayer is efficacious, it works. And, uh, and they packed up and moved. So here I am at the payphone, 360-281-4001, thinking my dad is just a couple miles away at their house. And my dad picks up the phone <clears throat> and he says, hello, this is Michael. And I said, Michael, this is your son. And uh, like, I think if you listen closely, you can still hear, you know, that like absolute vacuum between my father and I. I mean, it was just, it felt like an eternity. It was probably just a moment. And the next thing my dad said when he, he gathered himself together, he was weeping and he just said, where are you? I said, I'm at this gas station. Just don't you move one inch? And he hung up. And not 10 minutes later, both of my brothers came flying in like bats out of hell, you know, in their cars. And they're like, we have instructions to get you on the next plane um, out of here. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, and I'm like sick from detoxing and everything was a blur. They drive me to the Portland airport and they throw me on a plane uh, there was no direct flights to Milwaukee, Wisconsin that day. So my parents flew me to Minneapolis and then drove all the way out there so that I wouldn't go AWOL. I get off of this plane. I had a beard. Uh, I'm wearing, you know, shoes that are duct taped together. I hadn't showered in like months. Um, I was just a wreck. And I remember getting off the plane and um, I saw my parents maybe a hundred yards away and they're frantic, you know, and like my mom is just like, looking at everyone and blah, blah, blah and, and they're kind of running. My dad makes eye contact with me and he just covers his mouth and he's touching his heart. And my mom ran right past me. She didn't even recognize me. And my dad runs after her and he grabs her and he turns her around. He says, that's your son. That's your son. And uh, yeah, it was wild. And uh, so obviously, you know, you can think here of those prodigal son stories. Um, you know, uh, I pretty much told my dad, thanks for everything you gave me. Uh, I don't need you anymore. Uh, I wish you were dead already. Give me my inheritance. And so my dad had every right to disown me, um, to hang up the phone. But like the prodigal son or the prodigal father, you know, he and my mom just had amazing mercy on me. They showed me great mercy. They put a robe on my shoulders and sandals on my feet you know and our son who is dead has come back alive you know and uh so they drove me back to milwaukee wisconsin again i'm like where are we what like what are you even doing out here i had no idea what was happening and they explained to me what's going on it was all a blur um we get to their apartment i'm detoxing i remember just like hallucinating and i was shaking and um, my mom was just like stroking my head and my dad's praying divine mercy chaplets and rosaries. And, and here's the problem with our, our system here in the United States. You know, I'm like out of state, no insurance, drug addict. So everywhere they're calling are all these for-profit rehabs, you know, and they want like 15,000, 20,000, 30,000, six month wait. My parents are like, kid's going to die on the couch tonight. Like if you don't get him in somewhere. So they prayed another rosary and they got one more Google click away and it took them to a place appropriately named Genesis um, in downtown inner city, Milwaukee. This is a kind of place like the cops drop people off to sober up in the middle of the night. Sure. It's not a $20,000 a month. You know, I mean, it's a revolving door treatment clinic. She calls and the nice nurse was just like, we would love to have Michael Joseph down here. We'll take good care of your boy. Get him in here now. It was like uh, one flew over the cuckoo's nest kind of place, you know, um, hospital gown, nothing sharp, um, lights on in your room constantly staring at white padded walls. Um, I was in there for a long time and it saved my life. It saved my life. Um, 
people were having psychotic breaks, um, trying to commit suicide. I mean, it was wild. Saved my life. People came in there and taught me about the 12 steps. A doctor came in there and took me under his wing, um, got me the appropriate medication I needed, got my, uh, you know, chemicals balanced again. So I'm in this place for, you know, a good month or two. And, um, I started reflecting back on my life. Where did I go wrong? Where did I go wrong? High school. Um, when I decided I didn't need God anymore. And um, so I didn't know what that meant, but I knew I had it. I had to turn my life over to my higher power as I understood them, basically. So my parents finally come to pick me up, graduation day from rehab. And um, so this is the first time we've had like a coherent conversation in almost three years. So there's that awkward kind of thing between us. They threw me in rehab, shivering off drugs last time I saw them. So, you know, they're kind of like, you know, sheepish and I'm sheepish. We meet in the parking lot. They're like, hey, how's it going? I'm like, good. You know, like, sorry about all that. They're like, oh, we'll work through this. Like, what's the first thing you want to do? Thinking I'm, I'll say, let's, let's go get a burger or something. I said, I, I don't know why and I don't agree with it, but I need, I need to talk to God. So can you take me to your church? my parents are like, oh my God, we got to like, they threw me in a car and they were like, we got to get this kid an exorcist. You're like, oh, we need all the holy water. And, uh, you know, so we went to this church downtown Milwaukee, uh, the Basilica of St. Joseph at, uh, it's this over the top Polish Roman Catholic church, um, run by conventual Franciscans. And so my parents noon mass, they go up to the front to pray the mass. And, uh, I'm still in my hospital gown and bracelet broken. And I'm on my knees in the back of this church, not knowing what the heck's happening. There's incense flying around and people are doing Zumba, you know, the kneeling, the standing, um, all this. And I just have no clue. But I'm on my knees in the back of this church as a broken, broken man. And this priest holds up this piece of bread in this cup. And he says, behold, the Lamb of God. Uh, this is Jesus, truly. This is the Christ present here now. He loves you. And all of your sins are forgiven. Run towards him. Feast. And uh, and I just like everything in my guts, everything in my being says, this is right. That Jesus that I knew of and about as a child was now like here. <laughs> you know, this is real. And everything I'd read about in the scriptures the gospel of John is happening here and in the Acts of the Apostles and letter of Corinthians. Like, this is what those Christians were talking about. It's happening in front of my eyes. I didn't know what that meant, but I, I count that as my first call. One day out of rehab, I said, ooh, uh, something just happened. And uh, so I kept that in my heart and pondered it, you know, for a long time. So long story short, I told my parents, well, hey, look, um, I'm going to start getting my life together, but um, I think I want to explore this Catholic stuff a little more. So, you know, let's get into RCIA. And they're like, yeah, you know, and then like, so I did that and I, I kept this kind of call within my heart for a long time. And um, so uh, I'm going through RCIA and, um, and this call starts to manifest a little more seriously. And um, Pentecost, I believe, of 2006, um, I, I go to be confirmed and receive my, my first Holy Eucharist. And um, my dad, just before Pentecost, he bought this uh, brand new car. It was a 2006 Saturn, a total dad car. You know, it was like this gold sedan, like four door. He was so proud of it. And um, so we're driving home. I had just been confirmed. And so mom's like, levitating in the back seat right she's like you know oh wasn't that just the most amazing mass oh our son is like prodigal son he's been through hell and now he's catholic and da, 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 da. and i'm like we're driving on the freeway like 60 miles an hour brand new car and i'm like yeah mom dad that was that was a beautiful mass i think that's the kind of mass i'm going to celebrate someday when i'm a catholic priest <laughs> and my dad almost drove that brand new car right off the freeway that morning and so we like pulled over and we had a very long conversation on the side of me why did you I said yeah I'm pretty sure God wants me to be a priest um, and I felt it right outside of rehab at that first mass he took me to and I'm pretty sure this is right um, so then began my uh, you know discernment and uh, process so I didn't have a real mature understanding of it so I just thought priest 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 um, 
So Archdiocese of Milwaukee, when we had Archbishop Dolan back then, uh, now Cardinal Dolan, you know, so I met with him and uh, the vocation director, I had the seminarians. And um, the more I discerned and took it seriously, I just realized, ah, that's, that's just not for me, um, that, that way of life, that calling. Um, so I filled out all the paperwork, had my hopes up, and was, ah, that's not it. So I put the brakes on that for a good while and kind of went into a desolation, you know, like, oh, Lord, what are you calling me to? And then I found out a little bit about religious orders, and I didn't even know those really existed. So I visited, you know, a whole bunch of different religious orders that come and see weekends, and and nothing really just hit me, you know? So I'm like, wow, maybe this isn't for me, you know? So this is going on for like a year, year and a half. And, um, so I'm kind of a little depressed, like, God, I thought you were calling me to be a priest or something, and uh, you're not making it very clear, so, you know, help me out. So the Marion Center, my dad's Catholic bookstore, was sponsoring a talk on Divine Mercy one day, and they brought in a guest speaker, Father Benedict Groeschel, God rest his soul. Uh, he used to be a pretty famous uh, EWTN, you know, Franciscan friar of the renewal. So he comes in, and he's up there talking about Divine Mercy, and I'm in the back of the room, you know, taking it all in. And, and then he goes off on a tangent and he starts talking about when he was a novice and he lived with this guy named Blessed Solanus Casey. And, uh, and he says, there's only two people I've ever met where I walk in a room and I know they're saints. One's Mother Teresa, the other is Solanus Casey. Awesome. And he said, uh, he said he lived with this guy in New York and um, the way he described Blessed Solanus and the Capuchin Friars, um, to me, you know, he said Solanus like answered the door at a monastery during the Great Depression. He just talked to people in their grief and gave them a good word. And then he started a soup kitchen and ladled soup into bowls. And uh, it was very simple. I remember sitting in the back of the room going, I could do that. I was like, I could do that. And, uh, and so I went home that night. And I was up all night on the computer. My parents probably thought I was still on drugs, right? So I'm like up all night on the computer and I'm going down the rabbit hole, Solanus Casey, reading all about him. And then, well, where did he come from? Well, these Capuchin friars. Well, what are they about? You know, so I'm reading all them. Well, where did they come? Ooh, St. Francis. When I met St. Francis of Assisi, uh, my life turned upside down. Um, this guy enchanted me. Um, I became infatuated with him. I still am. I think he did the human experience nearly perfect. You know, there's a reason why they call him the altar Christus, um, you know, like another Christ. I mean, there's no other saint with that title. Um, he lived radical poverty and radical humanity. And he just, he, he loved God and loved the poor. And uh, so I made a phone call to the vocation director. And uh, then the next day we were having lunch and uh, here I am. You know, uh, 13 years of studies later, and um, I was ordained a Catholic priest. So that's it in a nutshell, Eddie. How was that? I'm um, speechless. True. Okay. True. <laughs> that was so exceptional. I don't even know what to say. I uh, I had to hold back tears several times. Yeah, I've told that story a thousand times, and every time um, it's which means it's, that story is still living for me and there's still a healing process happening. But um, my parents are saints, man. And uh, the, fact that your mom, the fact that your mom reached out, man, I'm just this, I'm just getting started with this channel. That, it's just a blessing to talk to so many different people. And the fact that your mom reached out and she, in her words, I mean, it was a brief email. You could just tell the love that she has just in in the in that one paragraph that she wrote to me and blessed Solanus Casey it's just so funny my kids uh, that name came up just about three four weeks ago my wife yeah she listens to this podcast and and the kids learn about different saints and and um, it was there was something about him specifically and I'm going to have to ask them what it was. It was just my, my oldest was just amazed by the story that they heard. And these are brief stories. You know, we're talking two, three minutes long. Sure. And um, anyway, if you, if you have just an, a few more minutes, if you can go into, remember how I was talking about those three elements that you focus on yeah. as far as discernment, helping people with discernment and accompaniment, if you could just briefly go over what that looks like. Yeah. And also, I'm assuming you come, you've come across people like you, prodigal sons, mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yep. Um, and there will be more and more as this generation um, <clears throat> continues to, you know, engage the church and the world. Um, so I'm just kind of a manifestation of uh, my generation, you know. Um, I'm not your typical friar. I'm not your typical priest. You know, I'm a, a drug addict. I'm tattooed. Uh, you know, I mean, it's like, but that's our, that's our culture. And that's, um, you know, what's being called into sanctity and holiness nowadays. Um, so, uh, yeah, my first assignment when I was newly ordained, actually as a deacon, um, and then as a priest was to be a missionary. So my first year, last year was out um, in Montana. Uh, I was out in a, a St. Labre Indian school. So we've been with the Crow and the Northern Cheyenne tribe since 1929, the Capuchin Friars. So almost 100 years. That's incredible. Amazing mission. Amazing people. And uh, so I was a campus minister there and uh, I love it and I miss my kids. And, uh, you know, it was just a cool place, a cool culture. Um, and then the pandemic hit. And there's not much use for a campus minister when there's no campus um, sure. overnight. And so everything kind of shifted and my province called me and said, um, you, you do really great things as our vocation director, um, which is a, a big position. It's the largest office in our um, province and it's, it's, it's a heavy responsibility, but it's a cool challenge, you know, and, um, and I thoroughly enjoy it. So I've been doing this for about 10, 11 months now. Um, I, tell every candidate that contacts us um, that I am their useless servant. <laughs> uh, I am a vocation director, not a vocation hoarder. Uh, and there's a difference. So uh, Jesus Christ is the vocation director. Um, the Holy Spirit's the vocation director. God, the Father. I I'm just the instrument, right? I, I just walk with guys um, as they're discerning this call. Um, and it's really cool to just see how God is still working very powerfully. Um, and sometimes that means, hey, this, after a while, this isn't for you, you know, like, I mean, that's, that's good discernment, though, um, you know, like, this just isn't what God is calling you to, for a variety of reasons. Um, but, you know, I tell young people, hey, um, the saddest thing, I think, in the world is to get to, like, midlife and think, what if, um, you know, if, if there's ever been that slight whisper of God's voice in your heart saying, maybe what the heck, try it out. Um, you know, we do come and see weekends and virtual discernment events. I mean, you don't even nowadays need to come here. You know, like we normally bring you into the monasteries at the Solanus Casey Center in Detroit for a weekend. Um, we're doing it on Zoom, at least for now. Um, you know, talk to someone, talk to a vocation director. Um, but I always tell people, look, like I can only do so much. You've got to just stay in front of the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, keep going to confession. Um, stay close to God and the church and God will reveal himself um, to you slowly, but surely. Um, but like, let's communicate, let's talk, get that out of your head. And, um, you know, and then like see, because my hunch is, my hunch is this time, like few moments in human history, you know, we're coming out of a global pandemic, Eddie, um, where we've seen the fragility of the church, of society, of our government, of our economy, there's going to be an entire generation and beyond of broken human beings and broken trust and people that really need love. And boy, that's what religious do. We're professional lovers <laughs> and professional prayers. And, um, and it's like, this, these are the times when God raises up saints. God calls forth the unexpected to do amazing things in this world, like Solanus Casey. <laughs> you know, when he saw the Great Depression happening and he says, ooh, people need someone to talk to. And he sat at the front desk and that line wrapped around for blocks, you know, to just talk to this man and, and give them a word of hope and support. And then to put soup into bowls. I mean, this isn't like ground shattering stuff here, you know, as Capish and Friars, um, we're ground and pound. We're simple men uh, that pray very well, and we love Jesus in the Eucharist especially, and we love Jesus in the poor, and um, we go where people don't want to go, you know, and uh, and so we've been totally active throughout the pandemic, and um, we just keep it moving, you know, so I mean, hey, yeah, I just walk with people as they walk with Christ. Uh, that's it. Um, that's it. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, Betty, for this ministry. This is, uh, this is awesome. Yeah, I want to keep it going, obviously. Um, there are a lot of people <laughs> that want to share their stories, and we're already seeing that every story will produce a number of people that will come forward and say, that is my story. You know, <laughs> it's just amazing. Um, if you could, could you end us in prayer? Yeah. yeah, I'll uh, I'll give you the blessing um, that St. Francis would use uh, over his brothers and whenever he would meet people. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord let his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with kindness and give you his peace. May the risen Christ bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. All right. You take care. Until next time, everyone that watched this episode, take care and God bless. Goodbye.